All righty. Well, let's go ahead and get started. And it looks like our numbers have sort of leveled off here. So uh, welcome all. Uh, my name is Betsy Johnson. I am on the implementation team at the Treatment Advocacy Center. I am joined by my colleagues, Amy and Brooke. Amy and Brooke, you want to say hello? Hello. <laughs> hey, everybody. Thank you. Well, we're just really excited about the program that we have for you today. Um, we are going to be focusing on um, partnering with hospitals to ensure success. We know by the number of people who registered for this meeting that this is a really important topic to many of you. We often hear, you know, when, when talking about barriers with, with the various programs around the country, that getting hospitals engaged is, is a real struggle. And, and for me personally, it always makes me want to scratch my head because I, I always think next to the, the participants themselves, I often think the hospitals are some of the you know biggest winners when it comes to AOT. I mean, they, I, I just imagine how frustrating it must be to be in a uh, you know psychiatric unit and seeing kind of the same folks cycling in and out and just sort of feeling really frustrated that you know you haven't been able to have that impact that you you really wanted. And I think AOT really gives hospitals that opportunity. So I think it's just a struggle getting them to. Um, you know, to recognize that. And so we've got some experts here today that are going to help us give us some, some practical tips on, on ways you can work with your hospitals to engage them. Um, I do want to say uh, with full disclosure that the programs we hear to, uh, we're going to hear from today are, are, grant, are SAMHSA grant funded. So they're in the last year of a four-year grant cycle from SAMHSA. So they did have some, some money, but I, I think it's important to uh, kind of, we'll, and we'll talk a little bit about funding as we, as we discuss um, throughout the day, but I think it's um, you know, important to kind of listen beyond that because I think that a lot of the things that you're going to hear today are things that you can do uh, without additional dollars. Um, so I want to go ahead and introduce our, our three guests. Uh, we have Aaron Bates, who um, many of you will recognize. I would call him an AOT monitor. He has a I think he's a court liaison as his formal title, but um, his role is similar to, to many of you on here with us today. Um, he serves as the liaison between the court and the hospital and the provider agencies. He oversees referrals, the communication process. Uh, and he's uh, located in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, which is Jefferson County. And with him is Dr. Melissa Wilson. Uh, Dr. Wilson is a forensic psychologist at the state hospital and makes referrals to, uh, to the program that Aaron helps oversee. And then our other guest is Cindy Johnson. Cindy joins us from Houston, Texas. Um, she has a really interesting role there. I'm anxious for you to, to hear from her. She, um, she works for, I believe this is correct, works for a provider agency, serves as a hospital liaison, but is housed at the, or as a court liaison, but is housed at the, at the hospital. So um, lots of interesting um, um, uh, hats that she wears there. So uh, so we're going to go ahead and get start started. We're going to just do a little kind of Q&A discussion here for, uh, for the first portion of the webinar. And then later on, we'll open it up to questions and answers. Um, if you could put your questions in the chat box, um, Amy and Brooke are monitoring that. Um, unless there's a burning question, we might, we'll probably just postpone you know, those, the Q&A until the end of the session. But I'll, uh, if they need to interrupt and, and ask a burning question, we're certainly uh, open to that. So. Um, so I was going to ask Aaron if you just kind of kick us off, Aaron, since, um, like I said, many of the folks that are joining us today are serving a similar role that you do around the country. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about um, uh, what that looks like in Louisville and, um, you know, uh, and then how, you know, just a, a little bit about your your day to day responsibilities. Sure. Thanks for asking me to talk, Betsy. Um, so I am the court liaison and program coordinator for AOT. Um, Dr. Wilson and I uh, were with a group of people back in 2020 that helped get this program from paper um, into a reality, into an actual program. Um, you know, we actually started the program in July of 2020 during the pandemic. So we had a kind of a tough start, but we recovered and we're doing okay now. Um, but my day-to-day -day operations are I uh, recruit and supervise AOT clinicians. Um, our team, we have a, a therapist, a case manager, a peer support specialist. And we also have, for eight hours a week, we have a nurse practitioner 
who is able to be mobile and see people in their homes, consumers in their homes. So we're fortunate to have that medical provider there too. Um, I do outreach to community stakeholders just to build awareness of the program and how it works. Um, I attend monthly meetings with stakeholders and Dr. Wilson, I compared notes. So she'll talk more about those monthly meetings, but we, you can communicate with the stakeholders and about what's going on in the programs. Um, I also consult with other mental health agencies in, the, in Kentucky who are starting up their programs. So they contact me or Dr. Wilson and we kind of provide advice about how things, how we're doing things and apply it to their own program. Um, on the clinical side, I help lead discussions. When we have new referrals come in, um, they're screened by our therapists. And so we, we staff them as a team and help make that decision about if they're appropriate or not. Um, and also um, I attend the, we have twice monthly uh, monitoring dockets with Judge Burke. Judge Stephanie Burke is our, our judge. And so my role there is to inform the court about how consumers are doing in the program um, and make any kind of changes to the treatment plan that might they might need. So those are my main roles for AOT. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron. And Dr. Wilson, can you talk a little bit from your perspective what, what your role is in that program? Yeah, of course. Thanks again for having us here today. Um, so I'm the director of psychology at the state psychiatric hospital that I'm at um, in Kentucky. It's called Central State Hospital. Um, like Aaron said, we've been involved in the implementation of um, AOT since the beginning. Um, so we've been able to kind of start it from ground zero. Um, so a lot of my role has been with that, um, trying to figure out a system with the hospital and what that looks like with our treatment teams. Um, I supervise the psychology department here at the hospital, and we are usually the ones responsible um, for testifying in most of the civil commitment cases here at the hospital. So it's um, makes sense for us to be involved in the AOT process, having it um, be involved in the court as well. So I um, help the psychologists here with that. Um, I work on um, looking over the program here in the hospital and ensure that it um, flows. Um, like Aaron said, there's a lot of people involved and a lot of um, different stakeholders that are involved. So there are um, meetings that we talk about all of this um, routinely, but as far as like our my role, it's really just making sure that there's a flow here in the hospital and the student or the excuse me the patients are able to have that good transition from the hospital um, to the community. Um, having AOT as an option has been a really um, nice option for our hospital because being from the state side, state hospital, we um, sometimes deal with some of the patients that do have that revolving. Door door and they come um, back to the hospital. So AOT has been a nice option to give them another um, opportunity to go into the community. Awesome. Thank you. And do you help identify who, I mean, who would be good candidates? Yeah. So um, the way that it works as far as the flow on that end, um, so our hospital is made up of four different units. Um, each unit has a multidisciplinary team. Um, and that team is um, has a, you know, a psychiatrist, psychologist, social worker, various nursing staff, um, and so a lot of other treatment um, providers as well. So in treatment teams, that's when it's discussed about if someone would be a good candidate for AOT. Um, and then at that point, the psychologist on the treatment team will um, communicate that to our, we actually have an AOT hospital coordinator um, who is a psychologist. And so she um, takes the referral and then looks over the patient's history and um, ensures that they do meet criteria. And then she'll send the referral to um, the CMHC. Okay, thank you. So Cindy, I know um, <clears throat> a lot of folks on this call are gonna be really jealous <laughs> and, and want one of you in their program. And, and I know that that's not probably feasible, but um, <clears throat> tell us a little bit about your unique role, uh, if you would. And um... okay. <clears throat> okay, 
So I think prior to me coming and joining the team, which it was, I did join at the beginning of the grant period, but apparently there was a partnership prior to this grant between probate court here in Harris County and um, the Harris Center, and they tried an AOT program prior to the SAMHSA grant. And I, I'm not sure how long that went on, but it, it kind of fizzled out and it, there was some things that didn't quite work. So when they, when they were awarded the SAMHSA grant, because um, obviously they wanted to try AOT again, because um, there's such a true benefit um, to this, I got brought in to help um, with the communication piece between the hospitals, the probate court and the Harris Center. And I also got brought in to help kind of be the gatekeeper of the referrals because I think they were not having great, um, good candidates and, and great referrals prior, on, prior to. So we call this AOT 2.0. And so my role here is um, when I first got brought on, I, I requested to be housed at the hospital because I was originally supposed to be at our um, one of our clinics. Um, and so obviously there's a huge benefit to being at the hospital where I'm going to where where my role is to to market to the treatment teams, educate um, all the teams about AOT, the benefits, the services, et cetera. So I have spent these last three years really building those relationships, educating about the AOT program. Um, I'm the, I, all the referrals come through me. I do all my research on the, you know, do a, a thorough record review. Uh, I go and meet with the patients. I do the assessments. I make the recommendations to the team um, and then also get approval from probate. Um, I do all the core. I'm also the court coordinator. Um, so I handle all the court pieces that come through for, for the AOT patients, um, the modifications, um, both from, you know, when they come in from the community. Um, I attend the, the, the committee meetings monthly. I also am a part of the weekly status conference um, with the judges or with the judge. Um, so Really, I'm here kind of as um, the go-between and the liaison between the Harris Center, probate court, and the hospitals, because um, we also get to not only get referrals through HCPC, which is our county hospital here, um, I also can, um, we can get referrals from Ben Taub, one of our other county hospitals, so I do have a relationship with them and, and work with their teams as well, so I can I go over there and do assessments on those for those patients as well. So uh, that's kind of that's kind of it in a nutshell, but there's a lot more to it. <laughs> so So who is your boss? <laughs> uh, all of all of the above. Okay. So I have to answer I answer for you know to HCPC, I answer to probate court because they're the ones probate court is the one who actually hired me and brought me on. But I also am employed by the Harris Center, so to, so I answer to that the AO team there, and I have a boss there, and okay. um, so also to so to all three entities really. Okay. In your program, Cindy, you have an Aaron in your program too, right? You're that's not necessarily your role. You're not the AO team monitor. You, once so once that referral is made and the court orders it, then somebody else sort of takes it from there. So if that yes. um, that individual um, goes into crisis again and needs to be hospitalized, then do you have a role? How does that operate? Okay, so I consider myself kind of the inpatient team. I'm the, the main one over here. And there we have an obviously a whole outpatient team. So once once we bring in the patient, um, uh, the court order has been in place, and that and and I help transition the patient to the out to our outpatient team. That team takes over. So the project manager, um, the therapist, the peer support, the outpatient psychiatrist, they manage the patient once they leave the hospital. Of course, I'm always kept in the loop of what's going on, and and if they're in crisis and have to come back in, I do the modification paperwork, and then I I take over everything once they walk back into the facility here, um, and and we're all very much in communication um, constantly about patients both in and out of the hospital. And so when they leave the hospital for the second time, they go right back into the AOT program. 
Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So they're modified back out into the community to the same team, to the same case manager, to the same psychiatrist. Yes. And how does that work for you all, uh, Aaron and, and Dr. Wilson, when um, when someone's back in the community, but in crisis? Huh? Well, the, the court orders last for one year. So a person went back in the hospital would resume services outpatient when they're when they're discharged. So it would not um, cancel out an order going to the hospital. Does that make sense? Yep. And we're in communication um, with Aaron and his team. If someone is on an AOT order and they are coming back to the hospital or we came in and we realized that they're there, then either Aaron and his team will let us know like what happened um, or we'll reach out to him and um, stay in communication that way so we can um, better serve the patient and try to figure out um, what went wrong and what we can do differently on the next discharge. Awesome. And just to pig piggyback off what Dr. Wilson said, so if I have if we have an AOT client that's coming in from the community and needs needs to be modified back in the hospital, because I have access to all the the records, I will absolutely let the treatment team, um, you know, the attending psychiatrist in the inpatient, let them, and I'll I'll let them know, you know, their outpatient medications, and you know, um, give them clinical information of how they've been doing and and absolutely keep them updated of what you know what was going on in in the community. Okay. So Aaron and Dr. Wilson, I know um you know you're now in your I believe the you're going into the fourth year of your four year grant um and I know SAMHSA requires you to collect data on your program. I'm just curious if you can share a little bit about what outcomes you're seeing. Um yeah, um, so we have um, been doing this for, like you said, four years. Um, it's just like looking at the patients and having been involved in the um, program, it's very evident that um, some of these patients who have this history of violence have several hospitalizations and are continuously non-compliant with their medications in the community, once they are stabilized in the hospital and put on an AOT order, um, that those hospitalizations, we don't see them as often, so they don't come as often. Um, having Aaron and his team and other CMHCs that we work with um, just on board with that extra level of care has shown to um, really um, improve their stability. And we do have some specific um, statistics from our um, evaluation team. Um, they've been working with us from the beginning from UK and um, I think that one of you guys may have oh, all those. There, we go. there they are. So um, there's a 40% reduction in arrests. We have 14.3 um, decrease in detox, 74% decrease in emergency room visits. Um, we have 86% reduction in psychiatric hospitalizations, which we all know that that's, you know, one of the big um, drivers of this program. So that's great to see. 57% um, decrease in nights spent in jail, 40% reduction in homelessness. So um, we have seen that um, and just being in the hospital and having seen these patients come, you know, month after month, and then we put them on AOT and then we don't see them. Um, it's just really feels great. Um, a lot of our psychiatrists that have been in the hospital, that work in the hospital have been here for a lot of years. So they've seen that revolving door. And so that has been a big buy-in for them. Yeah. I think that too, it's a, it's a two for one because that reflects a lot of huge cost savings between jail and hospitals and also quality of life, you know, Consumers are going to have a better quality of life, not cycling in and out of the hospital and jail. So we, it's a, it's a double win for everyone. Awesome. Do you share that information with the docs at the hospital? Are they aware of those outcomes and, and other stakeholders that um, that you work with at the community level on AOT? Yes, we um, UK um, creates these reports and 
at our monthly meeting and say, we'll share all the data with us so everyone knows kind of how we're doing. Yeah, we have, um, it's called our topical meeting that our AOT program director hosts and the state hospital representatives are there, the CMHCs are there and the program evaluation team is there. And we go over the data that they have um, and we go over just the ongoing like service delivery, um, the program developments, um, um, any things that are like being um, like escalated as problems or things that are being, you know, escalated as successes, we go over that as well. And then in the hospital, um, when we do get these, uh, these pieces of data, I'll share it with our treatment teams and um, with, you know, the various people that are involved in AOT. Our um, hospital director has been a really big advocate um, with AOT and has been really, um, has been behind us this whole way and supporting it. So a lot of times he'll um, talk to the leadership about where AOT is and what we've done so far and um, what we're continuing to do and the data that has come from what we, the work we've been doing. Excellent. That's great. So Cindy, I think I, I might have referenced this a little bit at the beginning, but you know we uh, uh, hear from a lot of programs that really struggle with trying to get doctors excited about AOT. Um, they are either too busy, they don't want to testify, they can't, but they don't have time to fill out the paperwork. They think AOT is coercive. Um, or they're, they're, so if they're, you know, there's a revolving door. So you talk with one doc and then they're gone the next time they go back to the hospital. What, how do you handle those uh, situations and what advice do you have for others who are really struggling with that? Well, for us, I think like what Dr. Wilson was saying, we have a medical director here who is very much um, a big supporter of AOT. And so he's the medical director over to, um, we have the Dunn, the Dunn Behavioral um, Center and HCPC, they're right next door. They're very large hospitals with a lot of patients here. And um, Dr. Shahani is a huge um, proponent of AOT. So he sends me for referrals um, from the units that he oversees and he also conveys that to his medical staff. Um, I've been fortunate that um, I have, because I'm here at the hospital, I have direct access, access to all the units and all the treatment teams. I think just in this one building, I think we have 12, 12 units um, and each unit has about 25 to 27 patients on them. And then we have a whole new building with probably, I think it houses four or 500 patients. So I've, I have access to those treatment teams as well. So um, I, and I'm not going to lie. I mean, I have some doctors who are very big believers of AOT, and then I come across doctors who unfortunately um, are not as bought into it. And I just, I'm pretty persistent. I just see them in the hallways or I'll send them messages to their social workers and say, hey, what can I do to get a referral? Or sometimes I'll go um, look at each of their census and I'll go through the patients. And if I think someone's a benefit, I might go and approach the doctor. Hey, what do you think about this patient for AOT? Sometimes that works. Sometimes it doesn't. It's just, it's just persistence and determination. And the, they rely a lot. Our doctors rely a lot on their social workers. So I have a great relationship. I make sure to, to stay in communication with the social workers and I will send out periodic emails with um, flyers attached about AOT. Um, it's just constantly marketing because there is a high turnover, as you know, all know in the mental health industry. So as new teams come in or new staff members, I try and go talk to them one-on-one -on -one or educate them about AOT, let them know about our the benefits, the services, et cetera. So it's, it's just a constant marketing um, ploy that I do, I guess, so to speak. Awesome. How about you, Dr. Wilson? Do you have some advice for our viewers today? <laughs> yeah, um, well, I think that the biggest um, thing to tell them is that it works. Um, I mean, there's a lot of um, patients, the ma large majority of the patients, it works um, for them to have extra support. So these are individuals that we're talking about that maybe don't have a lot of um, family support. They don't have um, maybe awareness of their mental illness. They don't have that, um, you know, reminder to go to their appointments. And so if there's a team out there that can do all of that and, um, 
it can be communicated to the doctors that that's out there. Um, that has been really, I think, what's helped us a lot. We um, had we really had buy-in from the beginning. I think we're pretty lucky um, in that aspect because we have a lot of psychiatrists, like I said, that have been here for a while. So they've seen these patients come in and out and whether they're here under a civil commitment or here for um, a competency evaluation because they, you know, did something, um, got arrested, and then now we're here to evaluate them. At the end of the day, they're still here and they need, it's very clear that they need extra support. And so we um, have been able to, um, you know, implement AOT in a lot of our treatment team discussions, which I think has been really um, huge and just being able to talk about it as a treatment team, um, being able to compare, you know, what other level of service that there are out there. Um, this is our highest level of outpatient service here in our um, community. And so when we have, we're able to look through all the things that the patients have already tried and we like, well, why not? Why wouldn't we try AOT? Um, so that has been a lot of our discussions um, that the doctors really seem to um, grab hold on. And, you know, when this was first implemented and um, we started seeing these patients get awarded AOT and then they weren't coming here, um, again, that's, you know, just speaks for itself that they're not back and they're not needing that inpatient level of care and they're, be, they're able to be managed outpatient. So, um, you know, a lot of times it's a risk um, with patients. And I know Aaron, probably him and his team, it's an even bigger risk for them because they're out there in the community with them. But I know having talked to patients that have gone through AOT, their um, biggest uh, area of why they stuck with it or why they continue to do well is the persistence. And so it starts from the beginning, the persistence with the doctors and the stakeholders, um, you know, educating them about AOT and then the persistence with the providers, with the patients, and that's where it becomes successful. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Aaron, I know Dr. Wilson mentioned, um, you know, a lot of the folks in the AOT program don't have family involvement. Um, I'm just curious for, um, I know your program is at the point you you take referrals. If I'm if I understand correctly, you just take referrals from the state hospitals at this point in the process. Correct. You don't take referrals from the community, but I wonder if um, you know if you if you hear from families who are really struggling with a loved one who's kind of caught in that revolving door. What advice do you give to them? Like, do you tell them to reach out to um, the docs at the hospital when their loved one is hospitalized? To maybe. Uh, ask for, for them to make a referral to the program just curious what what your role is when interfacing with families well you know if if uh if a consumer is hospitalized at central state hospital we'd educate them on on tim's law let's call tim's law here aot but what to do but we also have other resources in the community for folks that are struggling you know we have a wide variety of outpatient services that in county services we have local hospitals that provide inpatient care, that, that provide intensive outpatient programs. Uh, we have a crisis stabilization unit we refer to. So if we can't make it work to get them in AOT, we refer to other agencies out there that can help them. Thank you. I, I know our, our questions are blowing up, so I, I want to make sure we allow enough time for, uh, for Q&A, but I did want to ask, about funding. So um, as you guys are coming into the last year of your funding with um, uh, with SAMHSA, what kinds of conversations are, are you having at the um, state and local level about continuing with uh, with AOT? Are you, um, Cindy, I wonder if, if that's a conversation you've been involved with and what that looks like for the future? Um, not in depth conversations that I'm involved in, but I am, a, I'm a, obviously it's on all of our minds because the importance of continuing AOT and how much we've invested and we're all passionate about the program continuing. So I know our agency is, um, the Harris Center, which is the local MHMRA, um, they're very invested in AOT and they are looking at other um, funding streams to keep this going post SAMHSA grant. Um, and so if they're they're looking to pull other resources from other, you know, other um, income streams um, from other programs, 
within our agency, but also we're going to be looking at petitioning Harris, Harris County Commissioner's Court um, with the help of the University of Houston because they do all of our um, data collection and, and stats on, on that end. So we're all going to go do a big pitch to Harris County Commissioner's Court to try and get funding uh, for ongoing AOT. And Aaron and Dr. Wilson, uh, do you know what's uh, what that's going to look like in, in Kentucky when the grant goes away? So um, they're, they're going to ask for a, a no-cost extension at the end of this grant. Um, there are funds that were allocated that were not used. So they're going to ask to extend that and also ask for some general state funds. And that happens at, in Frankfurt at that level. Um, but... I know that there is intention to do that. I mean, we can generate some revenue, some Medicaid-based services, um, but it doesn't cover all the cost of the things that we do that aren't billable. So I know that they're pursuing that at the state level. And uh, I believe that the state already allocated some money to expand the program to other communities that didn't that don't have it that weren't part of the SAMHSA grant. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, last year, the state. Um, allocate additional funds. So um, they've expanded it across the entire state now. Um, so the hope is to be able to maintain that funding. So. And so right now the um, referrals are not just coming from the hospitals. They're um, expanding it so that there can be community referrals. I know that there's jail, jail referrals. Um, and so they're making it so it can be used by anyone. Yeah. So when you say jail, oh, go ahead, Aaron. So seven counties contract with the state to take 10 additional spots, consumers that were referred from criminal justice system. Um, and these have, these have all been um, clients who've been in jail. Um, so we've filled five of those slots of the 10. So there's still a little bit of room left. So um, we've had, uh, state guardians and um, uh, jail psychologists file petitions for those people. So it's opened up a little bit, but mm -hmm. certainly not enough spots that we we're, we need more spots than that okay. for the need. So are these individuals who were being restored to competency at the state hospital? Is that or um, these were individuals who were who were in custody on criminal charges. Um, and they resolve their case and a condition that would be an AOT. Um, so they, they could not do that while competency is an issue. They, they cannot move forward the case while that's pending. So it would have been people who have, were deemed competent to stand trial. So uh, just uh, I think just a final question, and we'll turn it over to to uh, Brooke and Amy to hear what the um, what questions are out there. But uh, in terms of communication, sometimes we hear folks who you know um, really struggle with communicating with their system partners because there's not a release of information signed or um, uh, something of that nature. They're not sure what they can and can't share. So sometimes that gums up the the referral process. I just wonder if, if any of you can kind of speak to how you handle that. Yeah, I'm so um, I can go ahead. So we um, here at Central State Hospital are contracted with seven counties. So like I'm a seven counties employee and I work at Central State Hospital. So because of that, we have an open communication with seven counties, um, which makes that really easy since that, that is our uh, majority of where our patients end up receiving outpatient care. So we don't have to worry about that. Um, as far as our other CMHCs, we have um, Communicare um, that serves a lot more of our rural um, area and outside of the seven counties. And we would have to get a release of information in order to work with them. Um, we have our um, CMHCs come to the hospital um, 
they have been coming, they're pretty involved in the hospital, but since AOT has started, um, it has intensified. So now they come every Monday. Um, and so they're here and they um, we connect them with if they're a community care patient or if they're a seven counties patient. And so they can start that relationship with the outpatient provider. And um, and that the hope is that they will eventually um, sign a release if that is needed. Um, so we have a lot of uh, ways of connecting them in that aspect. Um, when our um, CMHCs come in on Mondays, that's specific for AOT. So we have the AOT evaluators that come in on those days. Um, and so it's just nice to have that system because the treatment teams know that, you know, we have to prepare the patient accordingly. Um, but that's helped us a lot. And that kind of goes for, for me as well. I'm a contract employee here at the at HCPC, um, and I'm also an employee at the Harris Center, so I have access to um, all of those records. Um, so when I do my record review, you know, I have access to that. And then um, we get our consent signed from the patient um, when they're here for, um, you know, for group homes, for probate court, for, you know, um, that kind of thing. So we get the consent sign while they're here. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Is there anything else you all um, would like to share before we turn it over to the, the questions? I think I'm... For, for me, for any new program, um, if, if there's any way to ever be housed at the local hospital or the county hospital or the psychiatric hospital, it's been invaluable for me to be here. I couldn't imagine doing, it would be hard to do this job. And I mean, I can't imagine doing it not being placed here. And I, I don't know if that's an option for, for, for people, but I know if you're a part of the SANSA grant, typically I think you have to have, um, you know, the, the provider, the hospital, everyone has to be a part of the grant. And so if, if if you're able to have a, a, a an employee, you know, be stationed at or housed at the psychiatric hospital, it's isn't. I mean, it's so important. I'll just add that, um, you know, having a hospital involved, especially like a state hospital, it's not. Ours seems small compared to yours, Cindy, um, but here it feels big to us. Um, but that is a lot of people and a lot of people involved. And um, having the relationships with the CMHCs um, for us has intensified since we have started AOT. I think the communication piece um, is the biggest part that can be a struggle. Um, having figured out like our system where we have like a timeline of when we do AOT referrals, when we, um, who refers them, who evaluates them, and um, when we petition the courts, who testifies, we have all of that figured out. That has been huge for us and has helped um, our hospital and the CMHCs as far as like the flow. Now um, we're in year four, so we didn't figure it out definitely has been helpful to have that communication piece um, at least partly figured out. Um, we, I had spoke a little bit about the meetings that we have. I think those are really important just to get all of the stakeholders on um, the same page. So um, we not only have just that monthly meeting, but we have um, uh, meetings with judges. Um, we talk with our judges um, here in Jefferson County and other counties um, if the judges want to meet together, but we just want to like go through any, you know, problems that may be coming up or miscommunications. Um, that has been really helpful. Um, and then we also have a, a quarterly stakeholders meeting um, that has been really helpful so that multiple people um, from all of the stakeholders can be um, involved and help figure out if there are any, you know, communication barriers. Um, now that we've expanded it throughout the whole state, um, it's been neat to see um, the other um, regions come on these meetings and start sharing, you know, their stories. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're just trying to help people and we're trying to um, break down those walls for them out there in the community so that they don't have to, um, you know, live a life inside a psychiatric hospital. So that communication piece has been really big.
I think I want to also, also add too that we talk about you know buy-in with, uh, with the doctors and the hospitals, but I think consumer buy-in is important too. Um, you know, us going to the to the hospital and engaging them in the hospital sometimes more than once, sometimes two or three times, mm -hmm. um, shows that we care. Um, we also use a client-centered approach, so we approach them with the attitude. Um, what do you need when you get out of here? How can we help you? Rather than coming with a head, head, you know, approach to where you must come and see us or else you're in trouble. So we try to frame that relationship at the beginning as a positive one. I think that helps too. And also if they're readmitted to the hospital, we also see them in the hospital um, that second time, let them know that we still want to provide care for them. Just made me think real quickly. So when somebody does come out of the hospital and into the program and they go and meet with the judge, is the hospital able to convey any kind of information, I can imagine through you, Aaron, um, information that they think is important for that particular individual or, you know, something for the, the judge to, to reinforce or to focus on or to encourage them in a particular way? Oh, yeah, I mean, they're discharged with an extensive plan. Um, you know, with their discharge, they see our therapist that day or the next day, the latest. And so we're able to combine the hospital's observations with our own clinical observations and present to the judge a plan about what we think is going to help be helpful for them. And the judge reinforces that when we're in the courthouse. So it's a very, it's a very non-threatening situation. The judge comes out from behind the bench and sits at a table with the consumer and the therapist there. And we kind of all talk um, in a conversational tone about how things are going, what can we do to make things better for you? So, we'll, so the judge is fully informed about what issues might be important. Great. Okay. Well, Amy and Brooke, I'm going to, uh, Turn it over to you to, to uh, go through. I see these questions just popping up one after the next. <laughs> so I'll defer to you on how best to handle it. <laughs> Amy and I are on top of it. Um, and thank you everyone for submitting um, so many good questions. I am going to address the ones in the chat and then hand it over to Amy to do the Q&A. Um, because we are somewhat limited on time. Um, for those that haven't had a chance to submit questions and do have questions, please make sure you do that now. So first of all, I just wanna reiterate that for everyone registered, you will get a record the recording of this event um, via email. I know we had some questions about that. So first I'm gonna go with Dave, um, who says hello from Columbus, Ohio and then is asking if the Commonwealth of Kentucky permits involuntary medications or lab work for those respondents on outpatient civil commitment slash AOT. Actually, interestingly, this came up recently and we don't at this point. And I'll just say that's not uncommon. Very, very few states allow um, involuntary outpatient medication. And even those that do, um, it's really hard to administer outside of a secure setting. So typically people have to get an ex parte order and have someone taken to a crisis center. Thank you. Um, and next I'm gonna go to Brenda who is asking, um, in, in both programs, how are families involved, if they are involved? So um, our therapists um, routinely ask permission during her, during her assessment of consumer to contact family, friends, and we'll get a release signed there at the hospital. And that's part of her assessment is to call family and get collateral information. And we have family members come in to court with the consumer. They can come into court if they'd like, if the consumer says it's okay. Um, we have, so as long as we have permission from the consumer, 
we love to involve the family in any way we can. And that goes for us too here in, in Harris County. Um, I, when I meet with a patient, I always try and get a release of information signed if they have any family that they would like to include, um, just so I can call and let them know kind of that they've been referred to our program, give an idea, you know, of what they, the family members can expect. Um, and, and that's a question. So if they're not open to family members being involved initially, then I know our therapist, once they get um, into the community and in their outpatient setting, our therapist and, and the click case managers will continue to ask if there is family involvement, if we can get a release signed, especially for those um, of our clients that live with family. We, it's very important that we, that we have that relationship because we also rely heavily on family to encourage medication compliance, open the door, answer the phone, et cetera, when, when, we're, when we're struggling in those, in those capacities. So family is yeah, huge. Good. Yeah, we take a similar approach um, at the hospital. You know, when they first come in, we're, of course, contacting family to try and figure out what happened, um, what, we, what we can do differently. And sometimes that means a higher level of care. So when they hear the, um, you know, the blurb about AOT and what that means and what that means for their loved one, um, they usually have buy-in and want that to happen. And so we involve them in that. Sometimes it, um, you know, it's dependent on their discharge plan. So some families will only take people back home if that's what they're, if they do that, if they do AOT. So there's a huge family um, component, friend, um, loved one, you know, we want to get that collateral information so we can make the best informed decision. That's great. Um, so Scott is asking, are your civil involuntary outpatient admission and medication petitions and hearings combined? And then comments in Illinois, these processes are separate, which adds process that discourages healthcare institutions from utilizing um, involuntary outpatient pathways to care. So I can speak to our hospital. Our civil commitment hearings are separate from AOT. Um, so that takes place um, a whole separate, it's on the same docket, but it's a whole separate hearing. Um, our involuntary medication is in the hospital is a separate hearing. And then the AOT is a separate hearing. Um, we usually do our AOT um, hearings first thing um, on Tuesday mornings. Um, so our judges are pretty aware of that process and we'll do that. And then we'll go into our civil commitment docket. That's, that's the same basically here in Harris County, um, all the, in, the civil inpatient commitments um, and the med petition hearings, those are separate from the AOT hearings. Our AOT dockets are heard on Fridays. So if we are bringing in a volunteer, if we're having a voluntary patient that's going to be an AOT and we're doing that commitment that's on a Friday. Um, and then they are, you know, obviously now an outpatient um, on an outpatient commitment, or if we're modifying from inpatient to outpatient, those also are on Fridays, but those are all separate. Everything, our AOT dockets are separate. Got it. Um, this next one is a comment. Um, which I'm going to read because I want Susan to know that she's heard. Um, she's sharing that her son has been hospitalized involuntarily in five different states. And because of that, no one could set him up with court ordered treatment in his home state. Um, and he falls through the cracks because of this. Um, and she's saying that being told she has to wait until he gets sick in his home state is not a plan. Um, we hear you, Susan, and I'm sorry that that's happened. Teresa is asking if you track housing prior to referrals um, and if you know the percent of participants who were homeless. For, for us, I don't have exact percentages, but because I handle all the referrals, I would say probably a good 70 to 75% of our referrals are probably homeless. I mean, there's maybe not that high, but um, the majority of our referrals are homeless, I would say. 
we do track that. Part of the data we provide to SAMHSA ask, where have you stayed in the past 30 days? So there's data out there. I don't have it in front of me, but there is data that right. we track that. But I agree, there's a lot of people who are homeless that are in the program. Hey, Brooke, can I just quickly respond to, to Susan's comment? Sure. Um, so one of the things, Susan, that we're working towards, we're, we're a long way from it, but ideally, once we build up the number of AOT programs around the country, we'll get, you know, if, if your loved one is moving from, from one community to the other, that the AOT order can transfer to the, the, the new court and the location where they move to. So we're building out, we'll have at some point a national map where you can click on the map and you can find out what counties have programs and who the contact is so that programs can start communicating amongst each other when that happens. Betsy? That's that can be really difficult because state statutes vary so widely. Um, it's going to take a long way to get there um, because in one state it requires a number of hospitalizations, in another it requires imminent dangerousness, and it 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 is because there isn't a national standard. It's very complex. Um, so Scott is asking about data that evidences a reduction in institutional involvement of AOT respondents, like readmissions, rearrests, et cetera. Um, I know that I only shared my screen briefly with those data points um, from the Louisville program, um, but yes, data exists, go, go ahead. And I apologize, we do have all that data, our University of Houston, does collect all that. I just don't have it in front of me. I apologize. It, I didn't. I didn't have that with me. Yeah, and the but data yes. that I shared earlier was just a snapshot of some of the data that was um, collected. But that was um, from eighty-four participants, and it was from fiscal year two thousand twenty-one through through two thousand twenty-three. After we had been in year, I guess, in two years of operation. Um, so Evelyn is asking if a patient can be ordered to AOT without signing releases. Yes. Absolutely. That's the point. <laughs> yes. It's an involuntary uh, civil action. However, um, the primary question from uh, the Q&A box is, how do you manage ROIs or the lack of ROIs? And we get this question all the time. We, we respect the, the law, so if if a consumer says, I don't want you talking to my mom or dad, then we don't do it. Um, and we have to adhere to those laws. Now, we have had times when a person initially refuses to sign releases and they become stabilized and we gain trust and we, we get those signed. So we don't give up at the first time when they say no. So. Um, and exactly. I, the question is really about exchanging information between partners in order to get the order. So I, it doesn't impact you all as much because you're all treatment providers. And so you can use the uh, continuity of care exception to HIPAA. So you don't need exactly. ROIs. Exactly. But, but have you ever run into that maybe on an outpatient basis or... How do you how do you manage that? And if you don't have any ideas, uh, I know Betsy does. Well, for for us, we're all this we're all the same treatment provider, so we're a one stop shop. So um, we're employees um, of the Harris Center and contract employees through HCPC. So the exchange of information happens, and we're all part of the court order. So the hair center is under the same court order as the patient. And so um, 
and our psychiatrists, we're all one, we're all one provider. So, right. And this is for, uh, like I said, programs that are not necessarily set, um, up, that way, yeah. set up where there is the continuity of care exception. And this is pre court order. It's like, how do you get, how can you make a referral if the person won't sign a release? And that it's typically um, exchanging information with the court, which there is no HIPAA exception unless it is an emergency. So if the person is in um, extreme danger or may cause danger, you, you know, HIPAA falls away. But if you have someone who's relatively stable, either in the community or in a community hospital, how do you, how do you make that, that referral? Yeah, there, there, the, the question right. comes up oftentimes when the referral is, comes directly from the community and the, um, the provider uh, has the information, but is reluctant to uh, submit it along with the affidavit to accompany the affidavit because there's no ROI. Um, so or there's a couple of workarounds. Uh, one in one um, uh, community in Texas, the judge has issued sort of a blanket administrative order directing the provider to share critical information when they have information about a referral to the AOT program. So it's just sort of that blanket court order. Um, another suggestion that we've heard from an attorney was if um, the provider wants to, you know, um, com complete the, uh, the the petition and they accompany medical information with, without including the PHI, they could submit that to the court. And then after the court reviews it, then the court could order them to provide the PHI. Um, so a couple of potential workarounds. Um, Evelyn is asking if AOT is mandatory or optional in all Kentucky counties. So um, it in order to put someone on AOT, we would like for their um, approval and for them to do it, um, but that doesn't always happen. We don't always get people's approval. So then if they meet criteria, they um, get evaluated and meet criteria and the judge signs the order, then it becomes mandatory in that instance where there's an order but we don't discharge every single patient on AOT, just people that meet criteria. And, and I think uh, Evelyn's question um, may be broader than that. Um, so I'm gonna give a different answer and go with one you like best, Evelyn. And that is, it depends on the state. Um, for example, in New York, um, every county is required by statute to have an AOT program. That is, I, and I believe Washington state also has a simul, similar statute. Those are the only two. All the rest of the states, it's really up to the jurisdiction whether they implement or not. And then there are places that have, um, you know, that, they're on an outpatient order via the hospital, but once they get to their home jurisdiction, there's really no coordinated AOT program to receive them. So that happens as well. Um, Amy is asking what the number of peers are that are employed on a regular basis um, in your programs, if you, if you use peers. We have one peer support person on and our we team. Also, we also have one peer support specialist in the team. Thank you. Not all programs have peer support. It's We really recommend it. Um, so. I, I absolutely second that. Um, our peer support is hugely important. He has a great relationship with our with our clients. Um, 
he's just been invaluable. So he can relate to them in a lot of ways that others can't. So peer support is huge for us. Right. Sorry, I lost where I was in the questions. There's there's a lot in the chat. Um, okay. So for both of your programs, how soon after discharge is the court hearing held or is it held before discharge? So I can speak to the initial hearing. Um, there is one held to determine if they, if the judge agrees that they meet AOT criteria and grants the order. So that for us always happens in the hospital. Um, it doesn't have to, it can happen outside of the hospital, but we have found it's most productive um, happening inside the hospital. Um, and then we, during that hearing, it's determined when the next um, hearing will be for their outpatient hearing. So then usually that's at like one week or two weeks um, after they get discharged. And Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong. They're held on Monday. It's usually twice a month. So the maximum will be about two weeks. Often it's about a week or even less than that. For us here in Harris County, um, our hearings, the initial hearing is held while they're in the hospital. It is required that we don't bring in any patients that are not uh, into AOT that are not inpatient. And so, and typically ours will happen on the day of discharge. We try and coordinate the outpatient hearing um, to be on the day of discharge. And so we usually hold our discharges until Fridays, which is our AOT docket. And then the, um, and if we do our extension hearings, those are um, either 90 days or if they are on a mod out um, and new into AOT, then it's 60 days after the initial commitment. Thank you. Um, and Mark is asking, in LA, they're having a difficult time getting local acute inpatient hospitals to refer and coordinate with their AOT teams. Um, and he wants to know if you have any, adv any advice on just getting those hospitals to engage. Um, it, he says the issue is there's not really an incentive for them to participate. I mean, there's just, um, I, there's a lot of data out there that supports it. I think that when we first started um, our AOT, that was what was presented to us and how it worked in other states and how, um, you know, productive it was um, for the patient. So um, it was the only option in our state. That's how we started it, um, really, the that was all we knew. So it's, um, I mean, I think just data is the biggest thing is giving them that information and how, you know, costs, like Aaron was saying, cost goes down significantly and usually money talks. And I think we're going to be faced with that, obviously, once our SAMHSA grant um, expires, um, and then we we eventually open it up to other private hospitals or community other other community hospitals. It'll probably be me marketing to those hospitals, trying to build those alliances and relationships. Really talking about like what Dr. Wilson said, the benefits of the program, um, the success rates, and and um, just all the data that's out there that supports AOT. And just and it's just persistence and always having AOT kind of um, in the conversation and just um, just kind of in everyone's face. That's, you know, that's how we've been been able to do it. But but to that question, we I have yet to experience that because we're not open yet to other community hospitals or, or other private hospitals. Thank you, Cindy. Um, one thing that I'm just going to mention that I think is important is Brenda wanted to clarify that uh, families can always provide information, even if you don't have a release, um, and that NAMI provides a lot of support and education for families. Okay. I think that is all the questions in the chat, unless I missed any. Amy? Those are in the chat, but there are more. Yeah, yeah, yes, there are a lot more. <laughs> I, 
Uh, so what support services are you providing in the community to keep people from uh, returning to the hospital? Well, with seven counties, um, we make referrals for voc rehab if they're just in working. Um, we um, assist them with accessing, you know, a, a Medicaid, SSI benefits, um, food stamps, heating assistance in the winter or cooling in the summer. Um, we also have funds available to help them if they need to pay a deposit for their rent. Um, transportation, getting them to and from appointments and to and from court. So we are, we're grateful to have money in our budget to help with those things that don't normally get paid for by Medicaid or the provider. Same, same for us. Um, we, our case managers um, provide the transportation to and from appointments. Um, they help uh, with applying for certain benefits. Um, we have employment services through the Harris Center. Uh, if our clients, you know, want to look at um, going back to school, they help, you know, fill out um, for grants, um, for education. Uh, we provide toiletry items, clothing items. Um, we provide phones um, so we can have, be in communication. Um, flex funding through the state is used for our um, uh, group home placements. Uh, we We really just try and meet their needs on an outpatient basis as much as we can so they don't have to come back to the hospital. And our psychiatrists, we have two that are involved in our with the AOT program. And if we start seeing a decompensation or deterioration, we get them in immediately to the outpatient doctors. I mean, our team, every just it sounds like with Kentucky, I mean, we're very hands-on, very intensive, um, provide in-home therapy, um, a lot of case management services. We have psychoeducational groups, peer support groups. Um, so we provide all of that on an outpatient basis. Um, and just so everybody is aware, uh, Houston uses an ACT model for assertive community treatment for every single one of their AOT people. I don't believe that's the case in Kentucky. That's correct. Yeah. Um, for both, uh, both programs, what discussions can you have with doctors who are wary to keep a patient hospitalized in order to obtain the order? So the person's basically ready to go, but you can't have a court hearing fast enough. Yeah, we, um, have ran into this. Um, I think, uh, one one thing you can look at is just, you know, at this point when they're being referred to AOT, it's likely that they have a long history of hospitalizations, that they have maybe, um, you know, poor support outside, and that's why they keep decompensating and coming back to the hospital. So um, we've been able to um, use that as um, reason for us to establish an appropriate discharge plan for the patient um, so they can go through the AOT process. Um, also, I think our um, medical providers, when they see that they have, you know, had this repeated hospitalization, sometimes, you know, changing their, um, you know, treatment regimen um, happens and that ends up taking a little bit more time. So it allows us some time to um, pursue the AOT process. Um, and also the other option is, you know, if a patient is uh, willing to be in the hospital and they're willing to be voluntary um, admission into the hospital, that's a huge buy-in. A lot of times once they hear the benefits of AOT, they are willing to continue to, um, you know, work the program inpatient um, so they can be the best that they can be and then um, go transition from that to the outpatient AOT. And for our program, um, all the doctors are aware of the length of time sometimes it takes to get a patient into AOT. So once they've made the decision to make the referral, they already kind of bake that into their um, treatment model. And um, they are they are just um, patient and will, you know, keep the patient in until we can get get them into AOT. 
Now, if a, if a patient doesn't meet criteria and they are demanding to leave, um, uh, you know, inpatient criteria, then they, they will discharge them um, at times without them joining AOT, but that's rare. I mean, our, our doctors are really good about letting the patients um, remain in the hospital until we can get the order. All right. Um, do you have any suggestions uh, for families who are reaching out with concerns, but our ROIs have expired? I guess I would just need to know a little bit more, need to know some more information. I'm assuming ROIs for the hospital or for- For um, providers generally. So if the person's in the hospital, the hospital. Mm -hmm. I mean, it depends on what they're trying to get information on AOT in general. You don't have to have an ROI for. So speaking about the program, and um, talking to, you know, whoever implements AOT in their area can help them facilitate that process. You don't need an ROI for that. And you can always hear that I'm Joe's mom and I think he'd be good for AOT. You don't have to tell them that you know, Joe has schizophrenia and he's taking Abilify and we're going to discharge him in two days. Yeah. Well, and I, and I come across that a lot if I have um, treatment teams here that have talked to the patient about AOT or, or they talk to the family and the family will call me to get additional information. I don't necessarily have an ROI from the patient, but I can give general information about AOT and just educate the family about um, the program. Also, but then, oh, and also, okay. if we if I if we come across a a patient who's not comfortable signing in an ROI, then I will partner with who like I'll find a tech or a nursing staff or somebody who has a pretty good rapport with the patient. We just try and do that work around, and um, you know, somebody who has good rapport with the with the patient can can be very influential. Um have you found that uh, clients being homeless is a barrier to engaging in AOT? It's not. It can be a barrier post-release from the hospital. Um, simply put, if we know, don't know where they are, it's hard to provide treatment for them. Um, but certainly that wouldn't disqualify someone from being an AOT. Um, and we also that's first on our list of things to address when di when discharged is if your housing is unstable let's apply for section eight let's look at options we have so i remember early on in the implementation of aot we were watching a webinar and betsy you talked about um appropriateness for aot referrals and homelessness was brought up and you were explaining like the types of homelessness so there's the people that stay put, there's the people that are wanderers, there are the people that, you know, may go, you know, different states, you know, so you have to like take all that into consideration when you're making that referral for AOT, because ultimately the outpatient provider needs to find them. That's how they're going to help them. That's how they're going to serve them. And so all of that is um, something to consider when we're making our referrals in the hospital and um, we're able to talk that out with the community mental health centers to try to figure out like what it's going to look like when they get discharged. As you were talking, Erin, I remembered when we were in uh, your court um, a couple months ago, there was a woman that was brought in who had been homeless and uh, had refused to come to court. And on that particular day that we were there, her daughter had convinced her to come in and she had a really excellent rapport with the judge and said she was going to come back. So. Yeah, um, and there are times when, you know, that consumer actually, we had a spot for it and, and transitional housing, and she declined to do that. And so our therapists 
drives by the area where she's known to hang out and has actually seen her on the sidewalk and done things. So, but there's consumers we we are we have that are homeless and want to be housed desperately, and there's those that are more comfortable for whatever reason on the streets. So it's a it's a mix. Same with us, yes. Um, do either of your programs uh, use advanced directives or healthcare power of attorneys or? I think that's offered, I mean, for them to sign, but I don't know that it's something that's a common practice. But I can't speak to that specifically because I don't handle that side of it. Yeah, I believe that all clients who come to Southern counties have an option to explore that, not just with AOT, but with any client that, that comes through. I don't know much more than that about that. Yeah, similar at the hospital. Okay. I think that is all we have. Well, that was awesome. Thank you all so much for participating. This is really, uh, really helpful information for folks out there. So we're really grateful for you for sharing your expertise with us. Well, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Yes, it was nice to be here. And if there are any hospital partners out there that want to reach out um, to implement AOT in a hospital, we would be happy to help. Also, Same. yes, I'm sorry. Feel free to reach out to AOT at Treatment Advocacy Center to schedule time to talk with Betsy Brooke and I, or just Betsy or whoever, because if we'd love to be helpful. And that's a dot org email. Thank you. I'm gonna put it in the chat. And also, I'm I'm happy to answer any questions. I remember when I first got in this role, I was reaching out to New York. I mean, I, I was reaching out to whoever I could ask because it is overwhelming and it's and it's um, you know you feel a little lost for sure. And I know I would reach out to Amy a lot and ask her about referrals and who makes a good candidate. And you know, it's a learning curve. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, you know, I'll, I, they can give out my my phone number, and I, I just remember it's it's a lot. <laughs> really appreciate that. Okay, and this will this was recorded and uh, will be on our website, our YouTube website, um, and then probably sometime next week. So yes, not next, the week after. I, I think next week, um, early next week, you all will receive um, an email with the link to the recording. Um, and thank you all so much. I feel like the the Q and A. Thank you, thank you, panelists, and also thank you, attendees, for the good yeah. questions. Yeah. Yes, excellent. Thank you for coming. Bye. Thank you, Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.